start. It's uh, almost uh, four after eight. Okay, let me know when you start the YouTube uh, broadcast. Now, let's go. Done? Okay. Um, tonight, uh, our guest uh, uh, of uh, Kadir Haas lectures in, on uh, global political economies, uh, Michael Keeney. Uh, he's a longtime friend, maybe longer than 20 years, indeed longer than 20 years. Um, we even co-authored a few papers together. Uh, we used to co-moderate a few lists. And at his uh, invitation, I even joined the editorial board of Review of Radical uh, Political Economy, uh, on which he also serves as an editor. Um, and... Uh, he is uh, an excellent writer uh, on uh, political economy topics, and he's going to talk to us uh, <clears throat> about Europe uh, today. Um, the title of his talk is What Sort of Future for Europe? And uh, I leave the stage to Michael. Thank you, Michael, for coming. Thanks very much, Sabri, and thank you to you and to Erin for the invitation. I don't know. If how I managed to get in such a, an amazing lineup of presenters, but I'm, I'm very honored by it. And I hope I can meet the expectations and do the series justice. Uh, as you'll find out, and as you probably have guessed anyway, it's uh, difficult to be optimistic about what sort of future Europe is going to have. And uh, that's something which I could even provide uh, a very short summary of the presentation that I'm going to give this evening, which is to say it's not good. And for those of you who don't want to know any more, it might be worth just going home and that's it. But if you want an explanation of how that conclusion was reached, then what I propose to do is go through a set of analytical tools or concepts which have been important in my own formation, if you like, with respect to at least attempting to understand what's going on in the world. And I'll present various key concepts that are, I think, very useful in understanding why, particularly in Europe, things are, are not as good as most people would like them to be. And I'll introduce you to some of the authors associated with those concepts along the way. This, by the way, is not going to be uh, an exercise in, in post-Keynesian economics, uh, which has been a significant part of presentations up to now. This will be relying more on, on a quite Marxist understanding of the subject of global political economy, which I'll define shortly. Then having presented some of the analytical tools and concepts, I think it's important to put the situation into some context. And I'll provide you with a summary of what I think are the most relevant details. Following that, a very short, very concise history of the European Union. How did we get to where we are today? And at the end, Based on all of that, I'll hopefully present to you a sufficiently persuasive prognosis of the current situation and what we can reasonably expect to happen in the near future. Now, starting with global political economy, which is the, the title of the lecture series that's been put forward here. And it's certainly the area of study that I am most associated with, interested in, active in, and it's where I do most of my reading and occasionally venture out to attend a conference or two, but I, I don't do that so much. But um, occasionally it's a good thing. Too much of it can be not so good. But uh, what we're trying to do with global political economy is basically 
combine elements of economic analysis with political science and sociology, in addition to other social science material of relevance in order to be able to reach explanations of phenomena that go beyond mere, you might say, surface empiricism, but no, also to avoid the kind of grand theoretical abstraction that particularly in economics and sociology can limit understanding as opposed to enlighten. And one of the authors I found most useful in my studies is William Robinson, who provides a, a good justification for what political economy should be able to do in its efforts to enlighten us with what's going on. Then a veteran of the Amsterdam School of Political Economy that emerged during the 1970s and became quite a force within the subject area that uh, has emerged during the last 50 years. Hank Overbeek, politics in advanced capitalist countries occurs in a fundamentally transnationalized space in which the distinction between domestic and international has blurred. In this transnational space, politics is formed around the fundamental interests of specific configurations of class fractions that successfully claim to represent the general interest, which I think perfectly sums up what it is that I'm trying to do this evening by showing that the phenomena of which I speak are indeed operating at a transnational level, that we have to think beyond state borders and see social forces as operating at a level above and below these. Along the way, we're going to be using some important concepts, which I think it's worth providing some kind of definition of. There are many definitions of imperialism, of course, and these are three good ones. Robinson, again, tells us that it's understood as the transfer of surpluses from one country or region to another, and the military, political, and ideological mechanisms which facilitate such transfer. Indonesian author and recent, uh, recently published book on global value chains, Intan Suandi reminds us that throughout the global south, the persistence of the hierarchical world economy is recognized by all classes, whether capitalist, whether proletariat, whether wherever you are in the system of production, this is something that's clearly understood. There is a hierarchy and that's not always or even often understood in the global north. And so Andy goes on to state that Imperialism requires not just the exaction of a tribute, but the restructuring of whole economies to meet the needs of the global or core imperialist powers. And that's a process which is actually going on very visibly right now at great speed, as we'll discover, not just with respect to the impact on the global south, but within what the Greek Marxist Nikos Polans is called the imperialist chain. This imperialist chain is being very radically restructured as we speak. Then we talk about class, which can be defined as a group of people who share a common relationship to the process of social production and reproduction and are constituted relationally on the basis of social power struggles. The concept of class can also be used for analysis of particular groupings within a single class, because it's rare that classes would actually be united in all things. And being able to identify cleavages within class formations and understanding why these exist is very important. What we call class fractions, in other words, and a more, uh, I would say, 
sort of a fundamental definition of where does class come from it springs from the exploitative social relation through which humanity's metabolism with nature develops. Every advance in the capacity to create wealth shapes new opportunities for appropriating unpaid labour. Hence, a new relationship between exploited and exploited, which is superimposed on those already in existence, which helps to explain, for example, why even in the most modern capitalist formation, you see residues of older social formations like aristocracy, like certain forms of religion, like older ways of doing things, older uh, cultural practices that nevertheless persist. And this is because they never went away so much as they were grafted onto or subsumed by the new practices which almost took their place, but not quite. In fact, most successfully from the capitalist point of view, when the capitalism as a system imposes itself on particular societies or social formations, then if it's able to use already existing practices in ways which are helpful to facilitating of deeper capitalist penetration and subsumption, then capitalism is very happy to use such practices. But it also helps to explain why there cannot be a unified world market according to a blueprint that you would see in a typical economics textbook. That there will always be local and regional variations which cannot be eradicated, despite all of the very misplaced optimism of the advocates of globalization, who now, only now, are beginning to feel like their time has passed, but they, they, they took the stage for long enough to make it feel that uh, their, their arguments were never convincing, but now Nevertheless, they had the, the pride of place in terms of being able to propagate their message. And that's clearly no longer the case. Another important concept, I apologize for all this text, by the way, but I think particularly given that most of the people in attendance are not native English language speakers, it's good to be able to have the text visible so that if you want to go back later and check exactly what this means, then I hope that's of use to you. But the transnational concept here is very suitable for our understanding of what's going on in Europe just now. And again, Robinson is somebody who's given a lot of effort to understanding what's going on with respect to transnationality and what that means in practice. And he's been one of the foremost advocates of the idea that there is a transnational capitalist class, that there is a, a set of people who are operating according to shared interests across borders. And this, this has been hinted at or directly spoken of for, for, for decades now, if you think about Samuel Huntington, the conservative political scientist who gave us the concept of clash of civilizations who more usefully identified the concept of Davos man, typically a man, and very much symbolized by the kind of gathering that meets every January in the Swiss town of Davos. And you're talking here about a global, dare I say the word elite, that uh, spans politics, business, finance and certain other key interest groups that enable the formation of a transnational view and set of interests which are then implemented to whatever extent they can be by the people who meet there on a regular basis. But a particularly interesting and useful concept is the one that's been developed by 
Case van der Pio, who is another product of the Amsterdam School of Political Economy. He's conceived of what he's called a Lockean heart and based on the philosophy of the English writer, John Locke of the 17th century. And what he means by Lockean heartland can basically be translated as the English speaking world. In other words, those countries that have inherited what the Canadian political philosopher C.B. McPherson called possessive individualism, that there is a strong individualistic philosophy that informs law and culture. And that's been carried from England to North America, to Australia, New Zealand, and pretty much wherever the British Empire ended up. And this, from Van der Peil's point of view, is something that has resulted in a long, centuries-long unfolding process of uh, global or attempts at global domination by the, the Lockean heartland or Anglosphere and a succession of contender states starting with France that uh, have tried to challenge this. And here we are today in which arguably there are at least two contender states which are struggling against the global hegemony of the Lockean heartland and its private property rights based principles. And it's defined here in the, in the third quotation featured that we're, what we're talking about is essentially a liberal English speaking Protestant Christian world created through overseas settlement and trade in the 17th century, alongside a series of contender states beginning with France. And in this struggle, in which the rulers of France and later rivals of the West faced the already established primacy of the heartland, two state society complexes have crystallized. In the Atlantic heartland, the capitalist class became the ruling class as an already transnational force, maximizing its freedom under the liberal state theorized by John Locke. In the contender states, on the other hand, a state class imposed itself on society and it, it demarcated a concentric unit developing under a rationalistic planning doctrine. So essentially, although each of the contender state examples is noticeably different, there it does, or they all share this characteristic that they are offering a very different economic model, which should already provide some clue as to the fundamental weakness of the European experiment of the post Second World War era. But we'll come to that in more detail later. Now that we've got the con conceptual uh, details out of the way, let's get down to some conjunctural issues. Where are we at the moment? Well, as anybody in the Global South who's honest will tell you, imperialism is very much alive and certainly has gone away. Tribute is being exacted, surplus is being extracted, and a lot of that can be read about in some very important studies, including in Tan Sawandi's book on global value chains. John Smith has written an excellent book on imperialism in the 21st century which goes into a lot of detail regarding the ways in which the globalization of production networks have resulted in a very sophisticated and efficient system of surplus extraction. At the moment, we can say, with respect to Russia and China, that there are at least two contender states challenging what is a US-led hegemony. There may be other states that could arguably be regarded as sort of challenging, if not quite as openly as Russia and China. 
But nevertheless, these are the two states which are in the firing line of the current US administration. At the moment though, and as documented in various sources, relying on various perspectives, there is a, a weakening of US-led hegemony in both absolute and relative terms. Relatively speaking, because the rise of China means that the, the unipolar moment, which was being spoken of about 30 years ago after the collapse of the Soviet Union, is no longer regarded as a relevant concept of the past, in other words. Meanwhile, Russia has steadfastly refused during this century to submit any more to what it regards as the diktats and unwarranted impositions of US-led hegemony with disastrous, catastrophic, and tragic consequences as we, we can all see at the moment. Not only though is US hegemony being challenged from without, it's also been undermined from within. And the experience of the Trump administration, the, the genuine shock that was felt by many people that Trump not only won the presidential nomination of the Republican Party, but actually won the election fair and square, as, as, in, as fair and as square as you can win any US presidential election. It's, it was a shock to a lot of people and uh, to the extent that they even named something called Trump derangement syndrome that uh, so many people were affected so seriously by the shock of this very significant challenge to the status quo. And that challenge hasn't gone away even if Trump himself is not as obviously potent as, as he was, although it's perhaps too early to say, but there is very clearly uh, a cleavage, a split within the USA, its ruling class, such that the what, what Trump referred to as the, the globalist tendency, which is has been represented by both main political parties in the United States, but which has found a more comfortable home at the moment within the, the Democratic Party, where it did very well under the Clinton administration, particularly, which created all kinds of problems which are now more apparent, but which will take a, a very long time, if ever, to resolve. That globalist tendency within the Democratic Party has, has done everything it can to undermine the legitimacy of the challenge that it's facing at home. But it's, it's also a reminder of the limits to which capitalism can be truly transnational. That capital as a social relation is something which is built on exploitation. It's a social relation which desperately tries to break free of the constraints that it finds itself dealing with. And one of those constraints are the limits of geography. But one of the things that we've learned through this recent experiment with globalization is that there is a limit to how much globalization there can be. And all the optimism that simply by opening up trade, making it freer, and removing restrictions would naturally lead to a free market. We tried that in Russia after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was a humanitarian catastrophe. And then they tried it with China, admitting it to the World Trade Organization and expecting that there would rise within China a middle class which would share the same aspirations and worldview as the middle class of the United States. Well, that hasn't happened either, for the reasons that 
we remain bound physically by our geography, by the history of place that we inherit. And that applies also to the United States, that there have been decades now in which large sections, large areas of the United States population and geography have been deindustrialized. They have lost their living standards. They have been working harder than ever where they can find work and still their living standards are going down at the same time as the their leaders have been telling them that they've never been more prosperous. Gross domestic product is greater than ever before. This is the most advanced nation on earth and yet the cognitive dissonance required to support that kind of argument is considerable and not enough as the political situation within the United States confirms. And because of this situation, this weakening of the United States as a, as a global hegemon, it still is a global hegemon. It's not as, uh, it's not as unchallenged or as strong as it was relatively recently. One of the reasons being that the financial crisis greatly undermined the credibility of the US economic model and the prescriptions which were being given by the Washington consensus. So there is at the moment, because of this dual challenge, particularly from China, which is the, the longer or regarded as the longer term threat to US dominance, there is a global reconfiguration of production networks and a desperate effort to decouple the United States and China particularly that uh, may, may succeed to a certain extent, but such as the, the level of integration between those economies that it would it would result in, in such costly consequences to, to both sides that it's there is, there is still a strong incentive for there to be, to a certain degree, integration. But the Biden administration has been even more aggressive in its treatment of China and China's development than the Trump administration was. Once again, you see that there is a strong element of continuity in the policies of the different administrations, that despite all the theater, there is actually, despite the splits that I mentioned earlier, there is also strong continuity. And one of the reasons that the, the globalist tendency within the US ruling class might actually be quite pleased to align itself with the more protectionist, nationalistic element represented by Trump and many Republicans is that uh, China represents a good opportunity to actually unite the country around a political goal that provides the whole regime with this, the legitimacy that it has been lacking without a common enemy. But we'll come back to that. And I think one of the fundamental insights emerging from recent events to do with the, the conflict in Ukraine, the almost, the very, well, almost instant, very rapid response of the Europeans with respect to the invasion of Ukraine and the almost instantaneous way in which they, having complained during the Trump administration that the United States was insufficiently involved with NATO, was insufficiently attending to its uh, security affairs in, across the Atlantic. Suddenly under Biden, we have a situation in which the, the enthusiasm with which European leaders turned to the United States has been met with a very confident and in some respects, even very arrogant counter response from the USA, as you'll see, the, the unequal nature of that whole relationship has become extremely apparent. But it does also confirm that, as William Robinson has been arguing for 
quite some time now that there is a transnational capitalist class which, via the investment decisions of certain large corporations and the policy decisions of political leaders, has become much more apparent in a way as the, the globalist dream of a single world market has effectively died, at least for the time being. It is, it is in retreating to a more defensible position that the outlines and contours and nature of the transnational capitalist class becomes actually much clearer, because now they are very much more united against the contenders that are challenging the hegemony of the Lockean heartland. But that means also that many of the states which are represented in this uh, transnational grouping are not natural members of the Lockean heartland, are not natural inheritors of the possessive individualism of the Anglosphere. And that's something which is a structural flaw in the whole European project as it has evolved. Oh yeah, and there's still a climate crisis in case you forgot. Right, so European Union, since we've been finally getting to that, some people would say that it's been a triumph of politics over economics. And certainly there was a, a strong political agenda which actually grew stronger during the, the 1990s with the single European currency Maastricht agreement and the gradual uh, accretion of power of the European Court of Justice over the, the national uh, parliaments and legal systems. Then, of course, the European Union has been used as a, as a geopolitical instrument starting well, from the very beginning, but much more seriously from the collapse of the Soviet Union onwards, particularly with the Clinton administration's deliberate use of the European Union as an instrument by which to extend US-based security interests such that the expansion of the EU alongside the expansion of NATO right up to Russia's borders was very much a part, a core part of Clinton administration foreign policy and security policy. Not that it's made any of us more secure, especially people in Ukraine. Then you might say that the European Union, as originally conceived, was an experiment in the, the functionalist sociology associated with people like David Mitrani, who said that through the cooperation of the everyday and between technical experts, you create common standards. And by sharing those common standards, you bring people together because their experiences, their, their knowledge, their everyday life becomes more and more similar. And certainly there are very practical uh, results and rewards from that, not least that with common standards, you're able to achieve economies of scale such that business is more profitable, greater surplus is extracted, and there is a, a forming transnational basis in support of this political and economic formation known now as the European Union. It's been a long time since uh, somebody would have argued that the existence of the European Union is, is, a, is based on economic determinism, but you would have to go a little deeper in order to make that sort of argument stick, I think, today. Although there's a very, very good analysis, which I've highlighted in the slide here by Bastian van Appeldoorn. His book, Transnational Capitalism and the Struggle Over European Integration, gives a very fine 
survey and analysis of the different class fractions within the transnational European sphere and how there were basically two main ones challenging each other. The, if you like, the more nationalistic, protectionist, Gaullist, you might say, formation, which naturally was led by France, and then the more liberal free market version, which was very strongly represented by Britain. You might remember Britain was in the European Union. And then there was a third class fraction, which was based on largely German concern with social cohesion and particularly the representation of labor in the decision-making of business. And that's, this is where the, the whole concept of social Europe came from. But social Europe has been a very distant third in the struggle between the, the liberal Lockeans and the protectionist Gaullists. And one thing we can say about the current situation is that there has been a failure of a regional transnational class to cohere because the, the lack of any sort of standout representatives of a European interest as opposed to a Western interest. Very, very significant. The fact that geography ties Europe to Asia much more than it ties to North America. And there is a, a kind of natural division of labor such that uh, particularly the, the energy resources, which are in such quantity in Russia particularly, but the former Soviet Union more generally, are there for the benefit of the, the industrial economy that is at the heart of the European Union, and particularly Germany. But despite the efforts of particularly certain German leaders, business and politics, their position at the moment is such that they are extremely marginalized and European capitalist class formation is very distant. And there's been lots of debate about this over many years. And these are books that I can recommend. They contain surprisingly prescient, foresighted analysis of where we are at the moment. A lot of what is happening today was, is in the text included in these publications. And another one of these contains this particularly appropriate quotation, and this is now almost 15 years old. The European powers arguably achieved their greatest, albeit limited, autonomy from the United States during the embedded liberal and statist era, the so-called Keynesian welfare national state era, to use Bob Jessup's term, long before the advent of supranationalism and multi-level governance in the euro. In other words, all the institutional mechanisms by which the geographically bound democratic processes of liberal democracy and, and the Keynesian welfare state, these were, these were bypassed in order to create this more simultaneously more authoritarian but also freer market structure. De Gaulle's assertion of state supremacy in Luxembourg in 1965 coincided with France's withdrawal from the military wing of NATO, along with challenges to the dollar gold standard, about which Michael Hudson might have things to say next week, and the attempt to forge an independent Middle Eastern policy. Uh, following the debacle at Suez in 1956, as the Franco-German axis weakened under the pressure of competitive austerity and uneven development, and as the common foreign and defence policy has merged into Atlanticism such that there isn't really a common foreign and defence policy at all, the increasingly fragile US Imperium is casting a widening shadow across Europe. This is already 
old stuff. This, this was published, probably written before Obama became president. That's how old it is. But nevertheless, never a true word, etc. It's a particularly important insight, I think. And it, it, there's an irony here that the United States declines relatively and absolutely. Or the European off. Union declines even faster, relatively and absolutely, because it has been unable to get out from under this Atlanticist uh, configuration that it's chosen to insert itself into. So yes, ladies and gentlemen, the, the prognosis at the moment is uh, not good, as I said to you at the beginning. So uh, sorry if you expected me to change my mind, but I haven't, at least not yet. What we've got right now is a very assertive, if not aggressive, uh, geopolitical stance of the US-led transnational capitalist class. And this has been well documented by many respected people of, of very various uh, political persuasions, points of view. Uh, I think of people like uh, Chalmers Johnson and Stephen Cohen and well, on the, among the, the Marxist commentators, Cyrus Bina, and then more conservative commentators also very worried about what's going on. There's a, there's a gentleman by the name of Andrei Martiano who's been writing some interesting things about the, the very distorted sense of reality that we have regarding US supremacy and the vulnerability of that in practice. So there's a whole set of people, many with views that I don't necessarily agree with always, but the point being that there's a broad spectrum of very informed, even expert opinion, which is very worried about what's going on just now because it's, it's dangerous, generally speaking. And it's to do with uh, an attempt by the globalists, the, the transnational capitalist class headquartered in the USA to shore up its position and where it cannot acquire either through purchasing or theft, if it cannot acquire the resources that it needs, or if it cannot prevent its rivals from getting those resources through legal means, then it is prepared to go to great lengths to make sure that they don't get them by whatever means necessary, even. And that's why it's particularly worrying just now not only with respect to the relationship with, with Russia, but also perhaps even more disturbingly with China. As we've agreed, or at least I've said, the foundations of the United States as a polity are very shaky. There is a lot of missing legitimacy, which until recently was taken for granted, but now has been greatly challenged such that there is a, a much commented fundamental deep and very bitter political split within the population such that the legitimacy of any future elections is now a major point of concern. And as for Europe, in the context of all of this, it chose a path of neoliberal reform, such that the single market took precedence over everything. And in order to enforce the rules of the single market, the mechanisms that had been put in place by the member states to mitigate the problems that free markets create, those mechanisms were removed. And as a result, there is much social discontent in addition to widening inequalities and a deepening 
crisis of legitimacy, culminating in Brexit, most obviously. And in addition, talk among other member states of increased Euroscepticism to the point that it's even been speculated that other countries would leave. Now, something to think about as we close this presentation. If you want to get a, a good indication of the sort of ally and the sort of protection that's provided by this ally and the sort of uh, security that's provided by this ally, then it's worth having a look at the consequences of the amazingly named Inflation Reduction Act of the United States, which has got absolutely nothing to do with inflation reduction, as even John Kerry admitted last September when he came out of an international conference and said he couldn't really see the inflation reduction content, but, he, but that's okay. We'll be hearing more from Kerry very soon, but when we hear so much about things like green transition and saving ourselves from the very worst that the climate crisis has to offer and how we can generate a new economic revolution, well, yes, across the United States, a new revolution is underway in sectors from solar to nuclear, from carbon capture to green hydrogen, and its goals are profound to rejuvenate the country's rust belt, decarbonate the world's biggest economy, and wrest control of the 21st century energy supply chains from China, which at the moment is the world's clean tech superpower. Last year's colossal Inflation Reduction Act and its hundreds of billions of dollars in clean tech subsidies are designed to spur private sector investment and accelerate the country's decarbonization effort. They're also designed to restore a sufficient number of reasonably well-paying jobs to voters who would return Democratic Party candidates to office, or at least the kind of Republicans with which the Democratic Party can, in fact, cooperate. It's truly massive, according to Melissa Lott of Columbia University. It's industrial policy. It's the kitchen sink. It's a strong, direct and clear signal about what the US is prioritizing. The ring of protectionism and the sheer scale of state intervention has alarmed its allies, however. France's Emmanuel Macron says the Inflation Reduction Act could fragment the West. Well, who, who would have guessed? Ursula von der Leyen, the European Commission's president, has complained it would bring unfair competition and closed markets. Well, that's tragic. But if that's the best that the European Union can do is to complain that the, the country that effectively sets the rules is now breaking them. Well, it's long overdue that they woke up and smelled the coffee because that's been going on for quite a long time. But I think the cognitive dissonance here is that Biden was supposed to be much nicer than Trump. You know, Trump was honest enough to say that America first, whereas Biden has been saying nice things like democracy first, which is it's very hard to argue against democracy first. We'd all like to see democracy first. But we're not, certainly not under this administration, because what we're seeing instead is that, uh, well, America First is actually going on in much bigger style than it was under Trump. At Davos, John Kerry said, though tweaks could be made during the US Treasury's implementation process, the basics of the legislation were exactly what we need. Kerry urged Europe to spend more on tackling climate change itself. So you've got uh, you've got basically the the Europeans complaining that the United States are not playing by the rules of the, the the free market. They're not playing by the rules of the World Trade Organization. And uh, Kerry is saying, "Yeah, so what? Why don't you spend more money on subsidising your own industries?" Which, in a way, makes a lot more sense than what the Europeans are trying to argue, because there would be at least the mutual benefit that if we really are going to achieve a green transition then by that sort of policy everybody would benefit but even so 
Volkswagen. This is where it, it, it gets down to the, the real nitty gritty. Volkswagen is putting on hold a planned battery plant in Eastern Europe and prioritizing a similar facility in North America after estimating that it could receive 10 billion euros in US incentives. 10 billion incentives. Just one company sets up a battery plant in the United States. And a battery company called Northvolt suggested it could choose the US over Germany when deciding the location of its next gigafactory, unless Brussels made, gave more concrete support. So this is blackmail that's going on here. This is this is the, the kind of friendship and security and cooperation that's been offered by the United States to its very important ally in Europe. So as Martianov has, has pointed out, I mean, what, what we're seeing here is a, a medium to long-term strategy of deindustrializing Europe by relocating the factories to North America. Stalin oversaw the dismantling of factories from Germany and then reassembled them back in the Soviet Union, but it's a, it's a similar result and done with much greater speed. Northvolt estimated it would be able to receive more than 8 billion euros in subsidies for one factory. So this is enormous money that's been played with here and it's it's been played with in such a way that it's going to be extremely hard for European producers to resist, which means that the European basis of any transnational capitalist class or even significant enough national capitalist class is going to be significantly undermined by this enormous financial largesse and as pointed out here by somebody who used to work at the US State Department and who's now a research director at the European Council on Foreign Relations, in previous years, the US would never have considered initiatives such as the Inflation Reduction Act without consultation, knowing that securing European partnership on geoeconomic initiatives was both necessary and non-trivial. Europeans would have participated in the early stages of formulating these policies, probably occasioning many hard negotiations and compromises. At the moment, however, ex post coordination works because the EU's deep and growing security dependence on the US means European governments have little choice but to defer to Washington on security issues. Security issues which exist largely because the European initiatives were undermined from the very start. And no alternative has been allowed. From an American perspective, the increasing integration of the security and economic sphere, particularly in the struggle with China, means that nearly every issue is a security issue. So we're back to talking about dual use technologies, which we used to hear a lot about during the embargo against Iraq under Saddam Hussein, that you even had ridiculous nonsense like uh, the strings of the bag had symphony orchestras, cellos, were regarded as dual use because in addition to using them on cellos, they can form part of the machinery of a dangerous weapon so that you're not allowed to import cello strings to Iraq under such regime. The Inflation Reduction Act is both domestic economic policy and a weapon for the US in the struggle with China. America expects Europeans to defer to it on the latter and mostly ignore the, far, the former. So far, it's working. So says the research director at the European Council on Foreign Relations. So, the final verdict, ladies and gentlemen. Well, have I, have I already given too much of a clue what that might be? What I can say is that, uh, particularly with reference to the planned presentation next week by Michael Hudson, I thought that it would be nice to remind him of an old sparring partner with whom he had significant discussions and debates regarding the catastrophe of shock therapy in Russia during the 1990s, with which this person was particularly associated. But this person is now saying, I see Europe as the big loser in this, by the way. 
In fact, I see Europe as a huge loser in this. I think Europe is in a trap. And the question for Europe, in my opinion, truly is, is your job to support American hegemonic aspirations or is it to protect European security? Because these are not the same thing, says Jeffrey Sachs only a few weeks ago. And you can hear him say it here if you, you really want to make sure that you read that right, you heard that right, it's there. And he says it in a in some kind of public presentation. And yeah, I think that's that's the final verdict. So that's about an hour. I think that's long enough. Don't want to depress everyone too much. But uh, that's, I think, where we stand at the moment. And there's so much more that could have been said there's, there's, there's uh, several books and all of this, but uh, a 55-minute presentation, that, that's pretty much all I can squeeze in. So thanks for staying awake, and I hope that uh, there's, there's still hope in all of this. Turn my mic on. Okay. <sighs> Any questions? John, before the question, please, if you have the PowerPoint for the question and answer part. Oh, you mean for... I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. He already closed... He was saying, would you be able to go close the uh, um, PowerPoint? Would I be able to close it? it? Close it. Okay. Now, you can ask the questions as I can. By the way, there is something wrong with my headphone. Let me correct it. Do you now hear me? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, very good. Um, I tried to correct it while your presentation, but uh, there was a problem. Uh, anyway, Unless there is a broad question from the floor, I had one. Um, about the position of the US uh, dollar. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, just today, a friend of mine, uh, sent me an email telling me that uh, one of his uh, uh, clients in Russia uh, asked him whether uh, he should end the payments in rubles or uh, yuans or Turkish liras or even uh, Saudi rials. Um, do you have anything to say about the state of the uh, U.S. dollar's position as a reserve and trade currency. After all, the things that happened uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Mm. Well, I think one of the things that's been speculated about very openly in the financial media is the possibility of uh, a kind of division of the world into currency blocks. And certainly there are structures in place that would make that more possible than it was before, given that it's already some years now since Russia and China together were developing an alternative to the SWIFT system, such that they would be able to avoid the fate of Iran, which was cut out of the 
SWIFT system some years back. And meanwhile, China has been investing heavily in developing its uh, digital renminbi. So they've also been conducting more uh, bilateral transactions in Chinese yuan. And the incentives are very strong for any contender states to reduce dependency on the dollar system simply because the dollar itself has been weaponized to such an extent. Originally, as part of the, the war on terrorism, but having developed these mechanisms to go after non-state actors, they're now being used on a regular basis against state actors and those associated with the state actors. So the there is likely to be, I think, uh, a reduction in the, if you like, the, the dollar hegemony that our mutual friend Henry Liu spoke of 20 years ago. Again, Michael Hudson, I think, is more likely to give you a, a better insight into that than I can. But my expectation is that the, the fragmentation of the world will include uh, a, a significant change in the currency system such that the US dollar becomes less prevalent in large parts of the world in contrast to what we've experienced up to now. Okay, you're muted, Sabri. Your machine, yeah. Maybe I should turn this on off so that I don't hear. You hear me now, right? Yes. Okay, very good. Uh, another thing that I would like to say before I ask a second question is that my friend also told me that he, uh, one of his clients from Georgia, uh, which has nothing to do with Russia, as you know, currently, um, suggested that uh, they are going to send their payments to uh, uh, the things that they bought from my friend uh, uh, in Turkish Lira. So, uh, some countries started to use their uh, local currencies as well. Uh, I'm surprised you didn't mention Bitcoin. The second question I had uh, was this. You talked about the proximity of uh, Europe and Asia and uh, interdependence between especially uh, Russia and Germany. Uh, do you observe uh, national capitals, the members of uh, German national capitalist class arguing for better relationships with uh, Russia, given that uh, it's to their benefit if they uh, uh, improve the situation rather than um, representing the US interests and just uh, not defending their own. Do they say, or uh, do you see any people in Germany who are arguing for this or observe? Well, I think the most famous one is the one that they've actively discredited for for a very long time now, to the extent that uh, he's he's regarded as a kind of sad curiosity more than anything else, or an embarrassment. But uh, Gerhard Schröder was absolutely clear from the time he was chancellor to. His career after that, when he, he was working with Gazprom, that he, he worked very hard to make that relationship work and to circumvent the problems that had been caused by the, the run-up and aftermath of the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, which interrupted the transmission of gas to Germany. So that's where the, the, 
the Nord Stream pipeline idea came from, that this was a way of getting around the, the difficulties that were being caused by that situation. And Merkel, I think, continued that, uh, despite being a political rival. I think she shared that perception that uh, there was strong, even compelling logic for German industry to take advantage of this plentiful supply of, of Russian energy almost on its doorstep. And there have been business leaders, if you look at the was it the Austrian Raiffeisen Bank, for example, they are very well represented in Russia. So the German-speaking world has had some very significant uh, representatives doing business, promoting doing business, developing business with Russia. And each of these individuals and organizations which have been associated with that policy have very recently been quite comprehensively discredited, excluded, uh, condemned for their naivety at best, or in Schroeder's case, he was greedy, he took the money, uh, quite unlike Tony Blair, for example. So it's, uh, yeah, there are, there are such people, but I think that as with the, the whole business that was called Russia Gate in the United States, where Donald Trump's election as president was supposedly due to uh, Russian interference on Facebook and, and other social media platforms, completely ignoring the long established, firmly embedded talk radio and Fox News channel that was on a daily basis broadcasting for Donald Trump and the Republicans more generally, that uh, somehow the Democrats would have just walked to victory had it not been for a few hackers on Facebook or a few well-placed advertisements. It's just nonsense. But, but that whole story effectively undermined the Trump administration's foreign policy with respect to Russia. And in a similar way, the, the, the strategy that had been continuous through the Schroeder and Merkel governments in Germany has been so comprehensively discredited now in official discourse that it's, it's very difficult for the no doubt many people who still would prefer to be following that sort of strategy, to speak openly about it, because to do so is to approve of slaughter and destruction, which nobody in the right mind approves. I mean, I, I certainly don't. I, I see still no justification for the invasion. But given that it was a real possibility, it was going to happen. The, the fact that it has been allowed to happen is is a colossal failure on the part of the United States, which could easily have prevented it, but didn't. Yep. Uh, thank you, Michael. And uh, Sinan uh, has a question. Uh, he raised his hand. Go ahead, Sinan. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor, for this uh, valuable, even delightful uh, presentation. Uh, since uh, it's a residue of uh, international political economy, uh, in my opinion, in terms of mainly European uh, Union uh, history. Um, actually, uh, I think, as you uh, mentioned, uh, European Union uh, founded... Uh, against uh, Soviet Union, uh, even uh, its birth uh, uh, sprang from uh, the foundation of uh, European Cool and Steel, uh, uh, European Cool and Steel um, 
co co uh, community uh, against a, a possible Soviet invasion. Uh, in terms of political economy, in parallel to this approach, a uh, European Union uh, economic uh, perspective uh, was based on a uh, welfare state. Uh, but uh, especially after 1980s, uh, European left uh, converted uh, trans uh, year by year uh, and uh, converted into uh, liberal uh, leftism, mainly uh, green environmental issues. Uh, I uh, mentioned this uh, since uh, even in Spain, uh, Social Democratic Party uh, reject uh, labor's uh, strike rights, for example. How can uh, we uh, interpret this kind of uh, policies in European Union in terms of uh, class conflictions uh, in uh, Union future? Since uh, additionally, uh, as you know, uh, after uh, uh, 218 a financial crisis, European Union uh, faced into a serious division between uh, northern countries and uh, southern countries uh, due to economic uh, confliction between uh, these two blocks. I'm in the process of reading a book by the English conservative philosopher John Gray called Fall Stone, which was published originally in 1998. And it was already at that time very critical of the whole globalization thesis that uh, we were all going to be in this global single market living and trading happily ever after. It, it was just not going to work, according to him. But what, and of course, he was correct for, for many, many good reasons. But one, one thing he also observed was that the the social democratic settlement that existed in Western Europe, largely from the end of the Second World War until the middle 1980s, the, the economic conditions for that were in a process of collapse. They were, they were no longer strong enough to support the kind of welfare system that relied very heavily on the fact that there would be mass industrial employment, not when the the owners of capital were taking advantage of the much cheaper labor further away, which was being opened up to them, first of all, through the, the GATT agreements, which eventually became the World Trade Organization, but then also China's opening meant that there was a, a significant, very large uh, working population very cheap, available for, if you like, uh, low-skill low production, but that rapidly upskilled as time went by. And then, of course, the collapse of the, the Soviet bloc meant that there was all that labor too, and they were very high-skilled. They had many good engineers, people who knew actually how to make things, and they were available at a relatively low cost further encouraging the, the relocation of production. Meanwhile, all of the, the, the less well-off, the less affluent, the sick, the elderly, the young, the people who, in other words, are a lot less mobile than capital, stay behind expecting to be supported as before by their welfare systems, but there's no longer the finance as available as was. And, as a result of that, there was an undermining of the traditional uh, economic and political basis of the social democratic parties. And they had to reinvent themselves in order to justify their existence. So you might say capitalism with a human face, or capitalism with a greener face. But what they didn't really want to discuss anymore was things like redistribution and inequality reductions because that would involve going up against forces which through various processes including legal and technological were increasingly powerful 
and able to use the the state, particularly in in British situation where the the Social Democratic Party, the Labour Party at the time, was very reluctant officially to involve itself in supporting strikes, which were fights to the death of the traditional working class, and as a result, the Conservative Party was able to maintain power for 18 years at first, and now it's been in power again for another 13 years. And the, the Labour Party, once again, is going through a process of making itself respectable by rejecting the opportunity to be more closely associated with the people it nominally represents, and all because it needs to impress the people it should be nominally against in order to achieve power. So that the same situation in Spain, and particularly once these parties achieve power, the, the, the people in positions of power are presented with all kinds of dilemmas and, uh, you know, as they like to say, tough choices. But uh, the choices are not so tough when, because of the decisions that you make, you're able to enjoy a very comfortable financial existence after you leave politics, which, is what as I, why I mentioned Tony Blair earlier. Uh, Tony Blair's example is a particularly good one because even the, the former national security advisor of President Jimmy Carter, a gentleman by the name of Spignia Brzezinski, complained in the pages of the Financial Times that Blair, Blair Blair's money making was was so disgusting, the way that he sold himself to anybody who would purchase his connections. But, uh, it, was, it was really distasteful to him. And Gerhard Schroeder, arguably, people have argued that he did the same thing by selling himself to Gazprom, but there was a, there was a, a very strong geopolitical element to what he was doing. And although he might have been well paid to do it, and he may have been able to finance the kind of lifestyle that all of us can only dream about, there was there have been ways for him to do that without involving himself in that geopolitical agenda. Very easily, an ex-German chancellor, reformer of the Social Democrats, somebody who transformed Germany's labour laws, he would have been a star on the international speaking circuit. He could have got himself a job at the IMF or wherever. But no, he was working for Gazprom, making sure that Nord Stream supplied, without interruption, the energy that Germany's industry needs in order to stay functioning in Germany. So that's now discredited. And we're left with a very unhappy situation that uh, has not enhanced anybody's security. And meanwhile, the United States is, is it's in a process of asset stripping. It's, it's purchasing through the bribery offered by the subsidies of the inflation Reduction Act, so-called, top European companies with uh, significant engineering and technological prowess are being lured across the Atlantic to set up shop over there. And I mean, the, the forces that you would have to resist are very powerful and it would take a particularly strong person to resist them. And we can see that there are not many European leaders with that sort of strength. So I, I don't know if that answers your question very much, but the economic conditions certainly changed, and so did the global ones. The, there was a much more aggressive policy towards the Soviet Union under the, the first Reagan administration. So that meant that uh, the, the old detente of the 1970s was, was gone and there was a much stronger uh, focus on uh, free markets and liberal market economy more generally, which meant that things like uh, anything with socialism in the world or social democratic even was, was no longer acceptable in, in many respects. So, yeah, it was, it was uh, a multi-level transformation. Uh, thank you, thank professor. You, professor. I think your examples uh, are uh, so uh, thought-provoking. 
<laughs> Thank you for that. Uh, firstly, uh, additionally, uh, you uh, mentioned that uh, United States uh, faces two uh, main contender. Uh, one of them uh, is <laughs> absolutely uh, China. Uh, the other one, uh, potentially uh, European Union. But nevertheless, uh, especially after uh, Brexit, uh, how it would uh, succeed uh, such a uh, such an aim? Uh, maybe uh, I I want to, I want to ask this question since uh, Britain uh, almost throughout history had a, a Europe, European uh, skeptical uh, political uh, approach uh, against uh, continental Europe. After uh, Brexit process, uh, do you think uh, German-French tandem uh, will uh, act uh, more harm uh, harmonious uh, against United States or vice versa uh, since uh, they uh, lost a uh, so strong and important partner, uh, even it's uh, one of uh, nuclear uh, powers uh, in the world system. <laughs> what you have to understand about the British nuclear deterrent, as it's called, is that uh, it's not for the British to use. It is, it is US technology that is only to be used with the permission of the United States. The British pay for it, certainly, but they cannot use it without the permission of the United States. But, but yeah, it, uh, it provides a, a degree of, uh, if you might say, security or foreign policy credibility to have such weapons, at least for some people. But France and Germany, yeah, your, your point earlier about the, the geopolitical rationale of the, the original European coal and steel community, against the Soviet Union. I, I think that was certainly on the agenda, no question, but there was also a deeper agenda. I think that there was a, a serious attempt to ensure that these two countries, which had fought very serious wars against each other, three wars in less than 100 years, they would never do that again. And the amount of investment that was done after the war in which parties of school children would be swap, you know, swapping across borders. There would be the kind of hope we now take for granted through the Erasmus system in the European Union. A lot of that was pioneered in the, the post-Second World War period and the efforts to create a more genuine cross-cultural understanding between France and what was then West Germany during, during that period. So, if you like that, you, you might see that as a kind of uh, organic uh, support that gave credibility to the, the geopolitical agenda, which was also in play at that point. But I think it's still the core of the European Union. But I, I mean, Macron has the instincts of de Gaulle, at least to some extent, and he's tried to do what he can to, if you like, exercise a European voice as distinct from a Western voice or a US voice. But it's been very difficult for him, especially because he's so, well, not unlike Biden in some respects, so unpopular in his own country. It's, it's difficult for him to claim to speak for France, never mind for, for Europe. But his his instincts are, I would say, strongly Gaullist. Even if his background is in investment banking and uh, he, he politically, in France at least, represents a more uh, sort of a small business and financial <inaudible> sector <inaudible> coalition of interest. <inaudible> has managed to alienate what remains of industry and agriculture, hence his, his uh, deep unpopularity. But uh, it's hard to see anybody who can speak authoritatively for 
a separate Europe. Europe. And that's why I don't think Europe is you... a contender state, even without Britain. Türkiye, the contender state alongside Akar, China would be Russia. Dedi, e and, and that's why olunca, it's been treated as, hani as such a threat. Even before, long before the invasion of Ukraine. And this is this is a process that's gone on for many years, many, many years, from arguably from for 20 years when the United States withdrew from the anti-ballistic missile <gülüyor> to at a time when the United States and Russia were supposed to be working together closely in the war on terror. And from that moment on, there has been a a very clear communication repeated over and over again from the USA to the Russian leadership, which is that uh, we were not we're not equal partners. We might occasionally be partners, but we're not equal partners. And you need to know your place, which to some extent, a large extent, has led us to where we are today. And it's, uh, it's a major failure on the part of both countries that we are where we are today. But the the Europeans in their efforts to try and solve that problem, almost every attempt that they've made to solve that problem independently has been undermined by the United States. So the Minsk II agreement, for example, the Ukrainians said they weren't going to abide by it and uh, the United States, especially when when Biden took office, it was, it was never going to be observed. So... No, Europe's not a contender. Europe's Europe's baby, barely able to stand up. And it's, it's possibly is, yes. Jeffrey Sachs is right uh, in what he said uh, in the quotation. If you said if you'd said such a thing twenty years ago, nobody would have believed you. I, I I don't understand his transition, but but he's 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 quite brave. What he's doing, what he's doing at the moment. No, but actually, um, for the past few years, he has been saying some unexpected things. This is not the first thing that he said uh, along these lines. Anyway, uh, it's about 9.30 now. Um, unless there is another question, I guess it's time uh, to end this. We took uh, about uh, an hour and a half, 90 minutes of Michael. And... 